Okay, welcome, welcome back, everyone. So the, the final session um, this morning is uh, the paper entitled Combining ba Bayesian VAR and Survey Density Forecasts, Does It Pay Off? Uh, by Joanne Paredes from the European Central Bank, to be followed by a discussion by Philippe Couret-Gourom from the University of Quebec at Montreal. So over to you, please, Joanne. Thank you. Okay, so many thanks, first of all, to organizers for including our paper in, the, in this very nice uh, conference. Um, this is joint work with Marta, Ivan Federica, and Francesco. Um, some of us are working at the European Central Bank, so you know, the, the, the normal disclaimer applies. Um, so let me start by showing you this picture. So how, how this project um, came about, basically, um, so this was before COVID, and this is on the left-hand side, you can see you know, the projection that the European Central Bank was doing for real GDP, this is, I think, uh, quarter on quarter. And basically, you, you see the, the bands that were around it. So these bands were basically constructed based on past errors. And, and that's the way the, the ECB was publishing. So we thought in, that we could do something for our policymakers. We could basically work on these uh, uncertainty bands. We thought that actually, you know, point forecast uh, is not the most important anymore. And we could maybe bring some tools in order to do something different something that incorporates maybe some downside risk or upside risk to the projections that we were here. As you see, they are symmetric on both sides. Of course, in the middle of our project, you know, what has happened, and you see on the right-hand side, is that COVID came. And once COVID was there, you know, and it was mentioned already this morning, you know, uncertainty divines exploded. And actually, you know, it was quite a difficult job for us, time series, guys to, to produce uh, something which can make sense, okay? So central banks turn, actually, actually uh, at least the ECB, turn into producing a scenario analysis, okay? And we produce a lot of uh, scenarios depending of, as it was mentioned, how we thought the COVID infections were going and what was gonna happen. So this tool actually, so I'm, I, I put to you these two pictures because we're gonna, I'm trying to convince you that we have created kind of a tool that touches upon the two the two aspects of it, okay? So we're gonna have some uncertainty different from, you know, this symmetry that you have with past errors. We're gonna create this toolbox that at the end of the day, you know, is also say, gonna say something in we're incorporating this toolbox and SPF, so this forward-looking information that is gonna help us, for example, to go through um, this period of COVID, for example. So let me, let me, continue by summarizing a little bit of, of the idea. Why B-bars? Okay, there are plenty of models in the market. You know, you can, you can have DSU models to forecast, you can do other simple models like a random walk. But we thought, you know, by and B-bars, they are simple to estimate, they are flexible, and actually they produce naturally, you know, a density forecast. And so they are a standard tool right now in the central banking community, okay? So we actually, that's in the positive side, but we also know that, you know, there are a large variation across models. And you can have basically models that are, uh, you know, different, have different settings, different priors. So it doesn't exist so one single model that is the best specification and it works for every single, variable or every single horizon, you know. So another drawback of these models, of course, is that they are backward looking models, okay? And when something happens, as, as, as COVID has happened, you know, um, they have problems with this never happened before events, okay? So in this case, uh, you know, uncertainty is you No, know? that is a real case. So what do we do? What do we want to do or achieve with this, with this, with, in this paper, or this tool? We basically wanted to create a toolbox which would kind of cover us uh, for this model uncertainty, okay? And at the same time, we wanted to actually not only stop there, but actually be able to include this forward-looking information, okay? So what we're doing, basically, is to estimate a wide range of BVARs, model specifications, and then we are gonna optimally combine them, okay? Um, 
and at the same time, we're going to incorporate this forward-looking survey information, you know, and we're going to check, and this is going to be using the SPF, which is well known, okay, and using something which is called tropic tilting that here I don't need to maybe, you know, uh, talk too much about it because it has been used widely, especially here in this fora, with many of some of you. Um, and we're going to check, basically, if this improves or actually hinders the forecast performance. We're going to talk about performance in two ways. Um, so the, we, we, for us, it's important not only to look at the density accuracy, so the, you know, the relative performance, but we also want to, 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 to look at the absolute. And we're going to look at calibration. And this is something that we also do in this paper, OK? So I'm going to already, just in case I run out of time, hopefully not, but I'm going to just already announce a little bit the, the results. So the first one is that actually, and this is not different from what has been found in the literature, we have other papers that actually find the same, you know. The target of this SPF, you know, using this SPF actually uh, helps and improves the forecast. Um, uh, in both sense, accuracy and calibration, but actually using both moments, the first and the second moment, would actually be detrimental, okay? Why is that actually? So these guys, the forecasters, are very confident. So their bands are very narrow. And this actually is detrimental to a density forecast, okay? So something that we bring in the paper, which is a little bit different from, and we have not seen it before, is that, you know, in this paper, we're going to do something which is, you know, we are going to combine, and this has been done before, B bars in an optimal way, and then we're going to, you know, tilt to, to, to the SPF according to some information, and then we're going to check this new density, how it, how it works, okay? So this is the normal. This has been done with combination, but also with individual models, okay? And this has been done widely in the literature. Something that we did that is a little bit different is actually what will happen if you tilt at the individual model, and then you combine, okay? So this is the step that we have not seen it before, and we combine, uh, and we, and actually we, we find that doing that actually is a little bit better than combining first and then tilting, okay? Finally, I'm gonna show you how this tilting and in this method in our toolbox will, uh, will work in a COVID case study, okay? Basically, and in comparison to what we did before, what I said before, when there is no COVID, you know, tilting to the mean actually is the right thing to do. But actually, this reverses when you have the COVID time. In the COVID time, actually using both moments, the first and the second moment, is actually good because the certainty is so huge that now you know, using the uncertainty provided by uh, the SPA forecasters is actually better preferred. Okay. So related literature, I mean, there are many of you here in the, uh, already in the room that have contributed to you. So this is, of course, you know, um, James in the forecast combination, you know, um, and, and then we have Todd in terms of the uh, old Talman. So here, also in terms of the entropic tilting, you know, Galvao as, as, as Clemens using the SPF. Um, I mean, Frank also is using the SPF now, so it has worked with the SPF. So I'm, you know, this is not an extent, extensive um, um, uh, slide, so there are many more that have contributed here. I'm, I'm sorry to forget some of you. Um, what? do we include in this B-bar? So let me talk a, bit, a little bit about that. So in this B-bar toolbox. So we have B-bars which will have a Minnesota pride with stochastic volatility, democratic pride with stochastic volatility, local mean, you know, time varying parameter stochastic volatility, and an observed component, okay? We have thought about this toolbox as something that, you know, uh, there is a way to incorporate new models. We just use the real-time data set, okay? And then you have to pass on, you know, um, the way in order to be incorporated, in order to be included into, into the combination, okay? So it's not a closed tool that, you know, that's the set of, the, the set of two uh, B bars that you can include. You can include even, even something else that is not a B bar, it could be included, okay? 
So what are we gonna estimate and we're gonna forecast? So we're gonna focus on, on GDP and HICP on the year-on-year -year growth rate at two horizons. The first, uh, the one year and the two years ahead. Why do we do that? Basically because it's the same horizon as we have from the SPF, okay? We are gonna go use the UBS SPF. So we are gonna have models which um, have this data set composition of three variables, so we call, call it small VARs. And then we have bigger models with 19 variables. And then we're gonna have also a bottom-up approach, which is basically having some VARs on, on these big four countries, each of them, and then aggregating them. Okay, so you can see. So at the end of the day, we have 13, right now we have 13 beavers, okay? So we're gonna do a real-time exercise, recursive estimation, and the vintages, we're careful that the vintages are corresponding to the SPF cutoff dates. And the forecast, we're gonna be evaluated now and date since 2000 Q1 to 2019 Q4. And lately on, uh, later on, we'll speak about the COVID case. So how we do combine? So I'm sorry we don't do something fancy here. So we do the optimal linear predictive pool, which basically we find the weights, you know, according to uh, the best combination in terms of log score predictive um, criteria. And so each of its, as, as you know, each individual model is gonna have a density function. And, and basically they are gonna be weighted these density functions in order to find one, the single one which has the best uh, log score. Um, the weights are constrained to be non-negative and sum to one, this is standard. Um, so another ingredient, let me talk a little bit about the Euro area SPF. Um, so since 99, um, we know, um, we are asking about the panel experts about the forecast for the Euro area GDP, growth, inflation, and unemployment. And this is for the one, the two, and the five year horizon. So, of course, the experts need to provide a point forecast, but also some probabilities about this forecast, to f the forecast to fall without, within predetermined, predetermined ranges or bins, okay? So what we do is the resulting individual responses, we are aggregating them using simple averages, okay? I know that there has been, there are some other methods here now that has been used, uh, uh, but we, 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 we stick to the one with the aggregates, okay? So we will construct, once we do that, we will construct in a non-parametric way, so with a kernel, a continuous distribution from these bins, okay? And why do we do that? We do that because we, not gonna only use the information the first and the second moment for, for tilting, but we want to also give the possibility to consider SPF as a new density or a new model that can include be included in the pool of the 13 models that we had before, okay? So, yeah. So I was talking a little bit about this, you know? So how are we gonna combine? Um, we're gonna include once, we're gonna include the SPF as a possible model to be picked up by the weights. This is the additional model in the optimal pooling. We're gonna do the tilting ex ante, which is what I mentioned before, which seems to be working, which is to use the entropic tilting to reweight these individual densities um, and take it first or second moment of them and then perform the optimal pooling. Or the other way around, you perform optimal pooling and afterwards, with the one density, the single density, you do use the entropic tilting to reweight the, the truss. Okay, so, yeah. Let me explain to you slowly this table, because it has a lot of information. So basically, in the paper, we show results for the point forecast, but I want to focus here on the density. Um, this is the results for the four quarters ahead and the eight quarters ahead. And uh, so you, you, you see results in terms of GRPS on, and log predictive score, uh, so it has been presented before. And then in terms of, this is for the relative the accuracy, but for absolute accuracy we use the, the PITs. And here in the PITs we use the p-values uh, of the Berkovich tests, okay, and at the 10%, so it means that Values below 0 0.1, it's gonna be 
uh, 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 is going to be not well calibrated, let's put it this way. And, uh, um, so the first column is the, uh, is the absolute score, so the optimal pool, okay? Then the rest of the columns are in relative to the first column, okay? And you, how you read them is that, um, you know, for the GRPS, um, below one is better, and in, for the log score, as it's a difference, positive is, is, is better, okay? So as you can see here, let me, let me focus first, let me say that about the optimal pooling, uh, we've, so there are a lot of results, and uh, you compare the individual uh, models versus the optimal pooling. Optimal pooling in, uh, improves the individual results in terms of forecasting, okay? This is not explained here. Then, as you can see here, it's for GDP, but we also have it for, um, uh, for, for HICP, that is the next slide. Um, the SPF is, in terms of GDP, not so, but if you take a look here, the SPF by itself at the four quarters and eight quarters, this is now HICP, you can see that in terms of HRPS, it's relatively doing a good job, okay? Uh, let me go back here. Then, of course, if you think about that, then including, it's gonna be, when you include the SPF in the optimal pool, it's gonna be giving a certain uh, positive weight, okay? And this is basically, you can see in the, this in the third column, where you know now you have values bef uh, below uh, one or positive in terms of the LPS. Okay, uh, you can see this a little bit more in terms of the HICP, which you see HICP forecasts from the SPF are really, are really good. Then, if you go back to this table, now we're going to show uh, the last four columns are about what I was mentioned before. So the first. Two are tilted only to the mean, and you can do it ex ante or ex post, and then the mean and the variance, okay, ex ante or ex post. As you can see, the best results are achieved for the ex ante, okay, not only in terms of relative accuracy, but also in terms of calibration. The PITS really improves a lot. And as you can see, the two at the end, they are really very bad calibrated. Why is that? Because they inherit, you know, to impose the variance of the SPF, which is actually not good, is going to actually be detrimental for the calibration. So let me show you something that I already mentioned a little bit. This is how we see how the weights are included into the, into the pool, okay? That will be, that will be the, so on the right-hand side, you, can, you have the acronyms of all the B-bars, okay? And this is what we see that is happening for GDP for quarters ahead. So this is um, optimal pooling without tilting. Okay, so if I go to the next one, this is the optimal pooling, but now you allow to include the SPF density. You see that the SPF has some weight, so it means that actually it's selected in the optimal pooling to, to, to in the weights of the optimal pooling to be included into the final density. Now let me go back, sorry, now it's a little bit small, but okay, on the, trust me, on the left-hand side, when I call non-tilted, is this one, that you see before is just a little bit more squeezed. Um, and I wanted to show you actually what happens when you improve the initial condition of the model. So if on the right-hand side, this is the weights that are picked once you, um, you first tilt to the SPF, in this case, the mean, okay? And then you allow the, you know, the optimal pooling to select the weights. This is a, what, uh, this, is a, this is a reflection of actually me, when you do this, the selection of the models are completely different. And this happens, you know, not only for uh, GDP, but also for inflation, as you can see. Okay. So let me spend some time um, to talk about COVID, okay? And, and something that, you know, COVID came, we were in the middle of this project, and we were thinking, okay, what do we do now? Um, so we experimented a little bit of what is gonna happen, and what was happening during this period, and how this will affect our toolbox, okay? So you can see, let, let's focus on the left chart. You see some density functions here. So forecast densities for two, I think it's 2020 Q1 to 21 Q3, okay? And this is Euro area GDP growth. 
Um, the vertical lines are the re is the realization. Okay. Um, so you can see. Let me see now if I can. Uh, yeah. Do you see the map? Yeah. Okay. Great. So you can see that at the beginning, of course, you know, in the SPF, this is done one year in advance. So it means in 2019, you know, and the Q3 2020 SPF doesn't know anything about what is going to happen. Okay. Then the projection for 20. 20Q2, which actually is done during the first week of April, so it's important to know about this, this, this fact, already reflects that something is going on, or the uncertainty of uh, the SPF respondents. Okay? So you can see it is the new density that we can construct. And from then on, of course, this is actually more the case into 21Q1, and you see now what happens also in 21 uh, Q2 and, and 21Q3. But these are actually quite good forecasts, you see? Knowing, knowing one year in advance that something is happening and this big drop in GDP, actually, you know, they were quite right on what was one year ahead, uh, no? It is the effect, of course, of the big drop one year before, but they were quite nice. So this is the, this is the information that we can get from the SPF. Let's go to the right side. Now, of course, backward-looking model, optimal pool, they don't know, we don't know anything about uh, COVID. So you can see that first three quarters, nothing different from um, SPF. But now in the fourth quarter, you know, we still don't know anything, of course, okay? So you can already see that the SPF could bring actually a lot of good information to this model, which being backward-looking, and not seeing anything in the data, because here the data is until, so it's one year before, so you have data until 19, oh sorry, 19Q4. I'm gonna go back, yeah, 19Q4. So nothing, the models have not seen anything, okay? And then, you know, this is the, you see 20Q1 data, which there was a little bit of COVID, so the model starts to uh, reacting. Uh, but then, of course, once you have the bleak, the deep and the and, and the mountain half. So you have here the the toolbox cannot react without any forward-looking information. Okay. So let's check how what what will be the you know the result of starting to use SPF in combination with the BVAR. Okay. So you can see already that this one before was in 20Q2 there was no support from the BIVAR toolbox for getting this forecast right. But already including in the pool the SPF already will give some density factor mass already here. As you can see, all also uh, 21Q1 is improving, but not only that, look what happening, what happens here. So this inherits the properties a little bit of, you know, of the forecast done by the SPF. So what I want to say with that is that actually SPF in this case is going to be a tool that is not only helping us, you know, uh, to give our information, but also to discipline some of the forecasts done with time series. We have been struggling, you know, time series models have been struggling, and we have a lot of papers how to be able to continue forecasting when, you know, we have these big drops or uncertainty. So, you know, there has been some uh, some papers now running, everyone will have been running in order to incorporate, you know, some new techniques in order to be able to correct for this fact. But actually what we're saying, what it looks like is that one way to go about it is actually tilting and introducing, uh, you know, tilting into, uh, into the VR models. In this case, forward-looking information, okay? So let me, let me continue with the last, no, second last case is going to be, you know, the tilted ex ante. So now we're going to not only, we're going to tilt the density function, uh, the densities of the individual models to the information of the SPF. And this is a result that I wanted to mention. Why? Uh, uh, there is a fact. So entropic tilting has a very nice characteristics, but be, being non-parametric, uh, the result of it, is, could look a little bit like, for example, this one, okay? So you have 
In this case, you have a density which is high by model, um, and and some this could create some troubles. Uh, why is that? Basically, this is the effect of not having support. So when the realization of where the mean you want to tilt to is too far away from the original density, you know, entropic tilting basically is a process, is a procedure which you are reweighting, you know, some draws. Um, and this, uh, and this, basically, the idea is that the original and the final density they're going to be as close as you no, know, the final density should be as close as possible as the original density. Okay, this is the the, the optimization problem, which is based on the school kullback Leibach distance. But of course, when there is no uh, support, uh, the the optimization has a lot of problems to arrive to reach this. Okay. And then it gives you a lot of weight to some draws, but it doesn't do a good job. So I'm actually working with some co-authors on, on some what we call parametric tilting, which uh, maybe so in the future I can present, um, which actually tries to overcome this problem. Okay, so you see that here, basically, it, uh, it has some problems here. Also, it's not doing a great job. So what is the best thing to do? Uh, so here is the result when right now use both moments, okay? So you use the mean and the variance of, of, of the SPF. So as you can see here now, you know, this has a better shape, so it's more disciplined. Still have some problems here in this, in, in, in this 22 Q1, but as you can see here, it looks like in times of a lot of turnover with a huge uncertainty, actually not only tilting to the mean, but also tilting to the variance will, will help. So let me conclude. Um, um, we have evaluated, you know, uh, in real time this density forecast for a Bayesian BAR, and we have um, looking at the point and density performance of all um, of the sample average and overall calibration. So we have seen that actually tilting not only helps, you know, for the relative, relative performance, but also for the calibration of the individual models. Uh, we have been using to, to, to do that, the SPF forecast, and, and we find that actually, you know, there are gains of, uh, from optimal pooling, but these gains are actually the most when you actually improve the initial condition of the models before. So that means you tilt before to the SPF, to the mean, and afterwards you do the combination, okay? In normal times, using the second moment actually uh, worsens the, the calibration and the density forecast, but actually when, you know, there's high uncertainty and extreme data realization, um, this uh, is not the case anymore, and using the second moment uh, may help, but of course this tilting should be used carefully. So let me stop here, and thank you, I think I have time. All right, well, it's going to be a discussion of this paper. I'm Philip from Université du Québec à Montréal. All right, how do we shift? Okay, so what's the context? I think the context is rather well known, but I'm going to go through it again. It's kind of well known that the SPF median point forecast is hard to beat. You can take I think, the separate forecasters and try to combine them, combine them in any way you can try to find, usually the mean is kind of hard, you know, it's a, and it's a pretty old result, you know, combining forecasts often, you know, equal ways are going to be hard to beat. It's also well known that B var density forecasts, especially those with stochastic volatility, they tend to be pretty good. So I guess this paper, you know, starts a bit, you know, by thinking about these two points and saying, okay, can we leverage those two things, you know, to do better? So. Something else, I mean, I think is, is worth thinking about that maybe was not, you know, highlighted as much, but I think it's, it's, it's good to remember. Uh, the economic mechanism behind BVAR forecasts is mostly understandable. I think that's, that's kind of important when you do forecasts. Uh, you want to interpret them. I mean, I come more from a machine learning background. Everybody talks always about interpretability. I think here the BVAR forecast, I think it's nice to acknowledge that these things mostly, when you provide a forecast to your boss, at least you can pretty much tell where, you know, where that thing is coming from. The SPF is certainly, you know, our forecasts are certainly backed by some form of economic thinking, no doubt about that, but from our, our, our perspective, what we can observe, I guess, as econometrician, it's, 
it's a bit of a black box unless you take the phone and call each of those forecasters and really ask how, you know, how it came about. So I think the BVAR is an advantage there, the fact that at least it's a model, it's consistent, and it has an economic mechanism that you can just look at. So like many things in econometric life, it seems that combining stuff uh, can do uh, the sum of the, you know, what you combine is going to be better than just the sum of the parts. So let's see what we get from this paper. So what, what does it do? It combines the SPF and various BVARs in, via a principled way. Uh, obviously, it has an interesting result when you take the, the BVAR, uh, if you tilt it to the, you know, the location, of the uh, SPF, then it, it's good, but then when, you, when you're tilting the scale, it, it doesn't seem to be as good. So this, you know, obviously what you want to do there is tilt to the mean, but not you know, involve too much the variance. And it seems, you know, I think in the paper, uh, something, you know, there's at least two or three paragraphs on that, if I recall, I mean, overconfidence from the SPF uh, forecasters could explain the fact that using their variance is not exactly what you want to do. Uh, it could also be that the design of the survey around critical episodes like 2008 might have been a bit, I mean, too rough. So uh, I think the bins might not have been, you know, correctly designed and things like that. I mean, it's kind of important to remember what's the, the base material here. So I guess, you know, some comments, some thoughts, uh, and I guess they're, they're going to increase in, in the level of generality. But, you know, at the very end of the presentation, we've seen a COVID case study, but then it was, you know, from my reading of the paper, it was, I mean, a bit ironic, and I'm, you know, I don't want to use, I mean, this term is a bit maybe stronger than my thought on this, but still, there's a bit of irony because during most of the sample tilting uh, to the mean, but, you know, not bringing in the variance, it seems to help, but then when we enter COVID, then it seems that, you know, the opposite, meaning we should use both moments, that seemed to be better. So. Obviously, it raises the question of when does it pay off and whether this thing is actually something that we need to forecast in order to use these tools and, and really win with them. Now, that is mostly due to the fact that the linear models uh, exploded uh, in terms of their uh, density forecast. And linear there, as you can see, is an italic. I think it's important because if you know, and there's uh, several papers doing that. If you use nonlinear model around that era, those tend to explode a bit less because, you know, nonlinear models, they can have some form of concavity and then you get less crazy extrapolation during highly uncertain time. So I guess one thing we can, you know, one conclusion we can draw from that is that judgment seems to be useful in periods of high uncertainty. That makes a lot of sense. But then in 2008 was kind of equally uncertain, obviously for different reasons. Maybe it was less uncertain, but at least it was certainly quite uncertain from what I remember being around at the time. And well, then tilting to the second moment was not so good. So really the question I'm raising here is, you know, how much tilting and what and when, right? And obviously, you know, an hypothesis could be the usefulness of the SPF second moment as a function of the pertinence of judgment in different economic times, which, it's, which is itself a function of the unprecedentedness of economic conditions. Very happy I managed to say that one. Uh, but you know, when you speak French, you're kind of used to these very long words. So anyway, maybe some rolling window lock score could shed some light. Maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe some, you know, maybe it's some switching going on. Uh, but might be worth uh, obviously having a look. So I'm going to go on and do, you know, some random perspectives from what I I guess I call myself here a non-bivarista, and this is the volume one of those thoughts. So the, the first, the paper discussed first and second moment, and now I think uh, Joanne, uh, you know, already sort of uh, hinted that he's working on extensions. I think you mentioned like non-parametric tilting, I guess. Everything here, you know, you probably already thought about, but the third moment is quite popular these days, and we actually heard about it just, you know, I think first presentation this morning. So, uh, you know, there's inflation risk, there is GDP risk, you know, there's tons of risk. And I guess the question is, you know, what should we expect from the SPF third moment and its pertinence for BVAR? Is it, is it usable? Should we, you know, use it? I mean, would it, could we tilt to the first moment, not the second, but the third, maybe the fourth, the tenth? 
I don't know. Uh, but I think it's certainly worth thinking about to link all that literature back to, you know, whatever at risk literature there is. And I guess also, I mean, I guess this raises a lot of technical question. I haven't played with that data myself, and I'm sure it's not as pretty as, as, as it looks, but maybe the survey bins are too rough, maybe they're not. Uh, I'm sure you know all about that, but obviously, you know, given you know, everything that's on the discussion right now, I think that that'd be cool to look at. Now, I'm gonna go into volume two, which as you can tell is much bigger than the first one, but that one is a bit closer to home. And it's, it's just really just bringing perspectives on all that. So there's ever accumulating evidence that non-parametric nonlinearities seems to matter for modeling aggregates, especially during uncertain time. I think there's a lot of very good people in this room that actually did work on that. And you know, you can do that with traditional statistical methods, you can do that with fancy machine learning methods, and we can get their impulse response, we can get their uncertainty, you can do good old ba good old fashioned likelihood estimation. Why am I telling you all this is that obviously during uncertain times, see maybe nonlinearities are quite important. And for these models, which tends to be uh, more flexible than healthy and targeted regularization, you know, in the Bayesian uh, language that would be called probably well-designed priors are always welcome. So I guess my, my question is, you know, you know, what do we do thinking that maybe you know, in 10 years or 15 years from now, I mean, most of, our, most of our model hopefully will accommodate for these things, and then you want to think about how to actually use the survey data. And I really thought the tilting approach, which I was, to be honest, unfamiliar with before I actually read that paper, I thought, you know, that's great. So um, you know, question number two is really, let's say we move from a class of VR that are linear to nonlinear, non parametric VR, which seems just like the inevitable thing that we're going to do in the next decade. Uh, you know, how could this paper ideas be applied to a most a more postmodern class of VAR? Because now we're we're in that era, it appears. And question number three is: Should we expect uh, the recommendations that you know that we got from this paper, so moment one versus moment two, to uh, you know to still hold, or you know should we expect a different thing? So I so I really think I mean it'd be it'd be worth to look into that and maybe you know last last thought that actually occurred to me on the way here this morning you know this healthy 15 second walk I took from the from the hotel to to the bank you know well I what I said at the beginning you know the B var are nice because we can interpret them and now we're tilting their mean towards the SPF forecast so I'm thinking you know let's say you want to interpret that forecast still and you know, how, how would you do that? So we sort of raise the question, if we're tilting the mean, is it because the mean is off and the model is misspecified, right? So I guess this slide here sort of comes back to that. Maybe you want to think about these methods, but in an environment where uh, maybe tilting the mean is not as necessary because it maybe does not arise from uh, misspecification, which then by itself makes the interpretation of the BVAR a bit more difficult. So anyway, I guess it's, just, I guess, food for thought, I would say. Uh, overall, obviously, like the paper, learn a ton. I was unfamiliar with most of the, of the stuff in there. Now I'm a bit more familiar, hopefully. Uh, so wrapping it up, uh, this paper provides a principled way of including the SPF survey information to improve BVAR-based density forecasting. And obviously, I mean, if it's not obvious to you, it's obvious to me, and it's well, going to be obvious to many people that this is a useful addition to uh, central bankers' econometric toolkit. All right, thank you. So he is moving, so <laughs> sorry for that. So let's see if I, I, I managed to, to, to write down all the nice suggestions. Many thanks for the discussion. I actually, I actually uh, gave me a little a lot of uh, food for thinking. Um, uh, let, me, let me see if I understand my own writing. Let's start from the back. Um, so the last question was about misspecification of the mean. Uh, and I, in your walk coming here, you thought about it. I, I wouldn't talk, I wouldn't think it is a misspecification itself. It's about the, you know, VBARs have this component being backward looking, you know. So incorporating something that you know is gonna happen or information that for the future, of course, should have some influence in the mean of the your backward looking model. So this is a way to incorporate this forward-looking information, and there are other ways. This is not the only way, okay? Uh, so you know, there are you know forward-looking information models. Stock markets are are known to be forward-looking, so incorporating forward 
you know, uh, stock prices in VBAR models. Sometimes some people are claiming that this is the way incorporating it, but there are other techniques, okay, to do that. So I would see this in that way. Uh, the tilting, I think you mentioned, you know, we're gonna go in the future for, you know, non-linear models, non-VR, and once you do that, what happens with this technique? I mean, the nice feature of nice, but also, you know, there is some drawbacks, as you saw, is that, you know, it's non-parametric technique. So the density of the B-bar doesn't need to be Gaussian. It can be any type of density. At the end, it's an optimization problem. So I think it could be applied to any type of model you have in mind, okay? So I, that, that, that is something that, and actually, you know, when you combine in the optimal pooling, you don't have a, it looks like Gaussian, yeah, but it's not, it doesn't need to have to be Gaussian, okay? When it's, it's a mixture of, of Gaussian in this case. Um, the think of the third moment, I think you are completely right. We are now moving to you know higher moments. That's why I'm working in this you know uh, parametric skew t distribution, which actually you know allows you to to think about higher moments like the third moment. Because of course we see the skewness that is happening in the market in terms of pricing and inflation. Okay, uh, and actually you gave me now an idea. I, know, I don't know why I didn't think about it to use it from the SPF. We are working on a project which basically we take, you know, the skewing is coming from the market. When you think about, you know, all prices, there are some options there, okay? And those guys are, you know, right now, you know, you look at the other prices in the future and how they are pricing, and there you find skewness. So we are using this skewness in order to introduce it in models like this and see how good they will be performing in terms of forecasting. So great point, yeah, and we're trying to work on this, and I didn't think about in terms of SPF, but yeah, right. Um, the SAR base beans are too rough. Uh, yes, it happens. Even, even in the, if I remember well, when COVID came, they didn't have actually the beam to, to be included. You know, the, it was so dramatic, the drop, that people could not say, you know, the probability is, you know, the bean, it was not included, this mean, or, I don't know, minus 9% or the drop, okay. So yes. This is an issue. Um, and I think I hopefully not forgot anything. Um, and of course, this is an empirical application. So SPF mean helps. Uh, the variance helps only in this period. We report that. Is, can you create a general rule for that? I still don't know. Um, uh, it seems that when, you know, there are things that are happening, you know, we react, no? So that is like time series, no? We have been working and trying to improve, you know, the where the, our models are estimated because they were not able to capture these dramatic uh, uh, changes in the data. Um, but that you can apply it, you know, in some years, maybe, you know, this is just a point in the whole time T, this happened already in the, as you, uh, as you, as you, as you said before, this discussion of nonlinearity in the 2008, the one in the water crisis, it came all about it. No, everyone was oh nonlinearity. After passing that, you know, this was forgotten for a while, and now it has come back again. Okay, so linear models actually were doing a, quite a decent job you know, uh, during the whole sample. You know? Of course, in episodes, very, 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 very specific episodes, you know, you know, uh, the nonlinearity kicks in, but it's always the case. Um, so uh, you, you, you have asked now that I remember something about the episode of the big financial crisis. Uh, in, the, in the paper, we, we actually plot the cumulative GRPS, so, and you see that actually these models improve at the time of the 2008. They, they, they depart from the SPF, actually they're doing better. Um, I think I'm happy to take more questions. Questions? A uh, really nice paper. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's going to get a lot of uh, attention. Uh, I'm kind of curious, though. Um, I mean, the, the way I think about it, when you're using a BVAR, 
you're focusing on quite a restrained information set that, as you point out, is, is very backward looking. And when you then turn to the SPF, you have something that's much more forward looking and really is effectively taking in, you know, the, the full information space. I, I thought it might be interesting to look at a halfway case and to use a big data approach to see, okay, so to what extent do results change if we substitute the SPF with a big data model, or to what extent do results change if you try to graph the SPF onto a big data model? What do I mean by a big data model? Uh, I, I guess the kind of traditional thing, if I can use traditional already, would be to use a, some kind of dynamic factor model. Uh, nothing to stop you from using, you know, a nonlinear machine learning approach and, and try to pull in, uh, well, anything you can really quantify, uh, text-based analysis or uh, numerical data. Uh, I thought that might be a, a ripe way to extend it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, in a way, so big data is, of course, so factor models being a, you know, dense models are a way to go. You know, you put more, you put more uh, variables, and then to try to summarize them in, a, in the factors. Um, a B bar at the very end could also be summarized into a factor. Um, factors. Um, so we have a B bar with 19, 19 variables, which, which we can claim that is kind of a big B bar, okay? Um, and, um, and then it is selected, actually, uh, in some of the ways I remember correctly, it is selected as one of the best candidates once you tilt to the SPF. Uh, it, it is a good way to go. This is how we thought about this project. This project is not about being restrictive even on B bars. It's about you know to have a protocol where you can include you know any type of model, you know that where you can have all the real time data and then you can select them according to their performance. Okay, so that is the idea of the big model. We started with actually and I call it B bar toolbox, but actually it's B bar toolbox stochastic volatility because all the models have stochastic volatility but I mean but it's you know we, we aim to in expand the idea and, and include more models so I, I, I so your idea is really totally right so factor models all the type of models are to be included yeah thank you so if I can restate your one of your results um, so it's basically it's better to recenter the distributions before you pool them as opposed to pull them, then recenter. So I wonder if you thought about, or if you could work through analytics of why that's the case, or maybe maybe James know that this is a result that's already known, because you end up with the same mean, right? So this has to be about the overall distribution and not the centering. Um, and the underlying distributions are mostly symmetric to start with. So I'm wondering if you could yeah, work through analytics of this is why this obtains, and it obtains under these conditions, maybe not some others. Just be a useful thing to have in the paper if, it, if it's possible to do or, or if the result already exists. So, so this is always had in mind. So this is an empirical result. We're missing the theory here or to, 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 to show analytically why is the case. And I think, I think we should go that way. So we have not yet, but we have started working. Basically, at the end, when I was, you know, and the combination idea, I mean, I always they had in mind, you know, the more diverse are the models, the better. But this is a little bit going against that thing, right? Because you are basically improving the initial condition of the model, but as you say, you are putting them on the same track. And then it seems that it, 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 it is it's more powerful. So actually, there is another paper to be done to actually try to understand why is this happening. So yeah, totally right. Thank you. This might be a, a strange question or, or, an, or a sort of uh, insufficiently thought out question, but I'm just wondering, um, suppose I have two models, you know, if I just crudely speaking, in a Bayesian sense, use aspects of model one to inform an analysis of model two, that's not the same as doing a Bayesian 
uh, analysis of model two that's informed by model one, if I got that right. Um, I'm wondering if that's true here or, or if things are symmetric in the following sense. Um, if, if what I sort of heard, I mean, the, the feeling I get is that you're kind of interested uh, in the BVAR and, you know, it has some appealing properties, it's easy to understand, what, but you're kind of interested in the BVAR. But you might want to peek at the survey data and, and use that to inform the BVAR, you know, if it's, if it's helpful and, and you're kind of looking at that. But I'm wondering about the other way around. What if you're a survey guy and you're really interested in the survey, but you might want to peek at the BVAR if, if it's helpful. Are you going to get to the same place in each of those scenarios? Or, or maybe it's not well posed. So if I think about the question, um, so the BVAR is going to have a different, so let's do the other way around. We start with SPF density. Okay, and then I say, I'm gonna inform, and I'm, I'm just thinking aloud, okay? Uh, I'm gonna inform my SPF with a BVAR result, okay? So when I do entropic tilting, I'm gonna take the mean of the BVAR, and I'm gonna take the, if I want, the variance of the BVAR. So the result, intuitively, for me, is gonna be different, because the properties of that mean, I don't know if better or worse, but it's gonna be different. So I don't know if this answers your intuition. So it's not the same doing M and then M2 to M2 and M1 if, of course, they have different pro you know, properties. So the mean and the variance are different. So this is how I would think about it. So um, I just have, a, I guess, a comment and maybe a question, which is when you're looking at the SPF, we know there's a lot of heterogeneity in the SPF, but one of the dimensions that's recently getting a lot of attention is rounding versus non-rounding. And um, I think there's a forthcoming paper, maybe it's already out by Matthias Hartman, that suggests that if you were to go in and sort of look at individuals who don't round, that it actually turns out that their, their density forecasts, especially the uncertainty measures, are much better calibrated. Um, so, so one issue is just that it may be worth looking in there and separating out the rounders from the non-rounders to see if that makes a difference. And then the second is more just a statement, I'm sure it's obvious to you, which is that when you do combine these densities forecasts and you're looking at the variance, that's, that's not really aggregate uncertainty, right? That's disagreement and uncertainty. And that most of that movement in those variance of those densities is being driven by disagreement. So just maybe a note or, or something to think about it in terms of what, it, what features you're really trying to capture from the density forecast for the estimation. Okay, good, good point. Um, yeah, on the, on the, on the SPF, uh, I'm not an expert on the SPF, so I know the colleagues who took care of it, but I'm aware that there are not only different methods, there are all, not only different methods uh, in this case for the rounding of the beans, but also for the, um, you know, for the way you aggregate the individual responses, okay? And I think Frank has a paper also using some mixtures, so it's a different way to do it, and there's another paper by Conflicti. So, okay, so maybe there is a quotation there that the variance is not good in a way we have done it. So maybe there is a different way of aggregating the data, and it's gonna maybe have a different result. So under that quotation, right. And I take note of the second comment, yes, thank you. 